welcome to On Point. I'm Rosanna Saracusa. This past Sunday was the 87th annual Oscar ceremony, highlighting one of the worst years for diversity, with no minority groups nominated in any of the acting categories. The lack of diversity may have left some members of the audience skeptical of the authenticity in the Oscar voting system. Neil Patrick Harris hosted this year's show and kicked off the ceremony with a jab at the lack of diversity. Tonight we honor Hollywood's best and whitest, sorry, brightest. <laughs> This year's Twitter hashtag, Oscar so white, refers to the lack of diversity among the Oscar nominations. Some people may connect that lack of diversity to stereotypes portrayed in films. Stereotypes are a widely held image that society places on a group of people. But the question is, do these stereotypes played by actors have an impact on the audience? On Point's Sharon Shin has more. Thank you, Rosanna. I'm here today with Dr. Sheba Lowe, a professor in the Department of Africana Studies at California State University, Northridge, and Diana Winter, a professor of media, theory, and criticism opinion in the Department of Cinema and Television Arts at CSUN. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for Thanks. having us. Thank you for having us, yeah. So the first question goes to Dr. Lowe. In today's society, some of the most prominent role models exist in film and television screens. Mm -hmm. How important is it for media to show a realistic and diverse representation of humanity? I think it's uh, one of the most important aspects of life because we really operate often in our actions based on the images that we see. I mean, I think that uh, many of our ideas about people in general are garnered from the images that we see um, because these images tend to be reinforced over and over. Um, whether it's through commercials, whether it's through film or TV shows. And we find that people often imitate those behaviors. For example, if there's a particular stereotype that we see, sometimes the youth, even though that's not an accurate representation, they will take on those, um, those types of actions because they believe that to be normal or it's normalized somehow through TV shows. And I see this probably uh, more prominently through children and the way that they reflect those behaviors that they see on television. And Professor Winter, what kind of stereotypical characters do actors of color usually play in popular film and television shows? Well, we see mostly criminal criminals. Uh, Hispanic and black actors have historically, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, been cast as the criminal elements. Um, we're seeing more Middle Eastern uh, actors uh, being portrayed as, as terrorists, which is un unfortunate. And then for Asian Americans, they're just not there. They are probably the most underrepresented group uh, in American television. And Dr. Lowe, why do you think these stereotypes are so prevalent in today's popular culture? Well, these stereotypes have a very long history um, dating back to post-slavery. Um, I think we can take a lot of these images as far back as the birth of a nation. Um, when that film came out, it was really sort of, um, uh, it was speaking to this era in which black people had become prosperous. Um, Post-slavery, they were building homes. Um, they were being, they were very self-reliant. There were a lot of black people in elected office, you might say close or more than the number today. Um, and so that was really a, a backlash to that sort of um, black uh, prosperity. And so these images were created in order to sort of control the white population. This was the, the, you know, the Ku Klux Klan emerged and used that same imagery. And you, that's where you started to see that criminalization of black people and this idea that you know, every black man is going to rape a white woman, white, white woman. And these images are very prevalent today, these criminal images, mm -hmm. um, as she said. And you, know, you see these sort of um, depicted over and over again through film and TV now today. Um, and I think that even more so, we see now these images depicted onto women as well in this hypersexualization. And I think these are really speaking to um, the nature of the uh, sexual crimes against black women. Black women were raped during slavery. Um, you know, we saw this as very um, prevalent even through the civil rights era. So what do you do to protect that, that image that actually black women are the victims of, of this uh, white predatory behavior? What do you do? But you create this idea that actually they're hypersexual and they're the ones who are aggressing um, the white men. Mm -hmm. And Professor Winter, in your opinion, does the portrayal of stereotypical roles played by certain demographics have an effect on young viewers and their social outlook on life? Absolutely. Um, the thing is, when something is on television or in films, it defines a people. It really does. Whether you self-define that way, it's defining it for the world. And if the world treats a certain group, uh, a certain gender in a certain way, 
um, then people can, you know, especially young people, they can adopt it. But it also can affect the population at large. Mm -hmm. When people do not exist in media, when people do not exist in media, it gives the impression that they are somehow expendable. Right now we see a lot of elder abuse because we don't see a lot of elder images on television. And so when people are out of, out of sight, they're very vulnerable. They can be very vulnerable. And Dr. Lowe, recently director Will Gluck directed a young black female for the mm -hmm. role of Annie. Mm -hmm. How do you think drastic changes like this affect the audience and their views of the movie? Wow, well that's a, um, it's a really loaded image. I think us being able to see a young black girl, especially with natural hair, um, is, was really critical to children. I saw children everywhere excited to go and see the film. Um, on the other hand, I think that seeing the response to the young lady um, was it, it kind of reinforced what kind of society that we're dealing with. Um, people seem to be very offended that there was a black woman, black girl playing Annie. Um, and on the other hand, I also ha felt it was, I really enjoyed the film, but at the end I felt it was really problematic that we had black families involved in the production of a film, but yet we didn't have a black family um, that adopted Annie at the end, and I find that that's we're seeing there fewer and fewer representations of black family in film and in TV shows. So Jamie Foxx is you know adoptive father, but why couldn't he have had a black woman at his side as well? So I feel like that's something that we don't we're not always uh, cognizant of that the that there's really a breakdown of the black family through this imagery, and then we we stop seeing that as normal. And Professor Winter, what has been the recent trend in the hiring and casting of actors of color in film and television? Well, the recent trend is not good. And, uh, you know, the studios, the industry are, are, are putting out their, their data. Um, everyone's trying to address it because it has dropped off drastically. Um, the last SAG data, the casting data, um, indicated that... Uh, uh, casting of underrepresented groups was down from the middle of the first decade uh, of the millennium to 20, uh, I think they did the, the study in 2008, so it has gone down to below what it was over 10 years ago. So that is definitely a problem. Can we say it's all about racism or sexism? We, we can't, because it's it, even though we think we're talking about something that is black and white, it really isn't. There's so many other factors that go into it. And Dr. Lowe, do you believe there's a lack of roles available for actors of color? Yeah, I mean, I think that's been the case for a very long time. But I think what's even more problematic is then when people of color do get roles, but they're negative roles. And sometimes we're just so starving to see our faces on the TV screen that we'll watch it anyway. And then it does have a psychological effect. I mean, if you watch a certain character over and over again, you actually believe it exists. And, and I've seen that even these kinds of roles they're imposing, even for black children, um, it's still the same roles, the sapphire. You know, for example, in, in Jesse, which is a children's program, um, I kind of screen it for my own daughter in the fact that, you know, there has to be at least one black image for her to be able to watch this TV show because I do see her sometimes take on these characteristics from TV shows mm -hmm. so that but then when you actually sit down and watch it with them and you see that the young black girl is intelligent but she's this sapphire all over again and then I saw my daughter taking on those characteristics and it just wasn't her personality so I said you know you can't watch that show anymore so it's not just simply about seeing people of color but what type of roles are they playing and do you know people that look and act like that. Yeah. You know, are these realistic people that 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 we would, you know, go to dinner with? And those images are really, really hard to find. And Professor Winter, as a voting member of the Directors Guild, could you briefly describe the voting process of major film awards? Well, let me tell you something. Voting is like a job. When the voting season starts, and I'm just in the Directors Guild of America, but when the voting season starts, you are sent a list. The list has about 500 to 1,000 movies on it, movie titles. And you have to select your five that you are going to put up for to be nominated as one of the five to be considered for all the members. And every member has to do this. Now, I do not see 500 films. I don't see 200 films. 
I see a lot of films, and you know, I've been in the guild maybe 15 years now. But when you were, when you're a brand new member, you're trying to see everything. You're trying to see. You cannot see all those films. And I think when we talk about, you know, people being snubbed or, you know, that kind of thing happening, it's really that a lot of people don't get to see all the movies. Um, movies that are put out by the studios, by the, the big six, they're sending out screeners right and left. But if you're an independent film and you don't have the money for screeners, you barely had money, you know, to make the film, you're going to put all of your money on the screen. So there is a disadvantage of people not being able to see the films. When you know, looking for the foreign films, you find yourself driving all over town to find these movies. And in in the Directors Guild, the foreign films are on the same list with the domestic films. You got to hunt them down and and see them. The ones that are easy to, to vote for are the ones that show up at your doorstep. So overall, do you believe the voting process is fair? Um. See, fair is one of those strange words. I don't. I can't say it's not fair, because every movie is on that list. Every movie is on that list. Now, films with bigger budgets have an advantage of being able to publicize uh, uh, their films a lot more than than independent films or films with smaller budgets. So, in a fair world, everybody would have the same amount of money, but you know, but they don't. Big movies have big budgets to sell around awards time. And Dr. Lowe, according to an LA Times article from 2012, Oscar voters were 94% white, 77% male, with a median age of 62. How do you feel about this representation? It's definitely not my demographic. Um, the representation actually doesn't surprise me at all. Um, and I would, you know, also say that, you know, your own sensibilities are depend on your culture. So certainly um, an older white male may not, for example, uh, feel close to the movie Selma. I, he may not emotionally react the way that I would react. You know, um, it's my history, it's my community. Um, but that doesn't surprise me at all. I think that a lot of times people of color, um, particularly youth, feel very disconnected from the Oscars or the Grammys. I remember it, you know, uh, back when, um, Hip hop wasn't represented in the Grammys, right? So people boycotted. Personally, I feel very disconnected from their process, and I kind of don't hold a lot of value to what they say is important. Um, so I think that's what happens: is they end up alienating communities of color completely okay. with that demographic. Mm -hmm. And this year, notable celebrities used the 87th Oscars as a platform to express their personal opinion. How did you feel about Patricia Arquette's speech about wage equality and women's rights? Um, well. It seems that she really tried to sort of offset, you know, what has been called like a vanilla show. Um, and she wanted to speak her mind and she has every right to do that. And certainly women do not have wage equality and, and don't have equality in many, many aspects of life in the United States. So I understand where she was coming from. And I think uh, I've had a few days to simmer over it now. I think a lot of people were very upset in the way the comments that she made later about um, how the gay community and communities of color need to come and fight for us the way we fought for you. And so positionality played a lot, a big part there that she's a white woman making those statements. So it kind of sounded like she was telling uh, the LGBTQ2, QT community and communities of color to come and fight for white women. Um, you know, perhaps she didn't mean it that way and it didn't mean to come out that way. I haven't read some of her responses yet. Um, but it did come off as if she was saying that those communities don't have women. That it, you know, she was. It was. It was a bit alienating, and um, and like as if she was wiping away those histories. Professor Winter also Sean Penn sparked some controversy with his comment about the green card when he presented <laughs> director Alejandro Gonzalez Iñárritu for Best Picture to Birdman. Right. What kind of message does a joke like this send to the world? Um, I don't know. Uh, it sounded like a really intimate comment between close friends that was shouldn't have been heard by the rest of the world you know uh, you know there's some things you're allowed to say with somebody that you're really close with that's why you know black people can call each other the n-word you know um, so I, I understand why people were why people were you know 
you know, put out of joint by it. I, I'm not going to condemn him for it, but, you know, it was unfortunate. You know, uh, Alejandro Iñárritu is, uh, you know, is privileged and he's brilliant. Uh, there's nothing that that comment could say that would make anyone feel differently about him or his work. And Professor Winter again, do you think racial controversy is overshadowing the true goal of the Academy to recognize excellence in motion pictures? No, not at all. I don't even think the Academy thinks it is. Um, and is that really the goal of the, of the Academy? Uh, you know, there's so many films that are not white, that are not black films that are not getting any attention as well. Um, uh, Jack Black did that that hilarious uh, production number at, in the uh, Oscar broadcast, you know, that basically voiced in song everybody's frustrations with the studio's obsession with making big blockbuster movies. You know, you know, ask John Sayles how he's feeling. You know, he's not a black filmmaker, but you know, we're not seeing a lot of of our smaller, more uh, nuanced filmmakers' voices, black, white, or other. Okay. And moving on to television, Professor Winter, mm. do you believe television media is further ahead in portraying actors of different races with hit shows like Empire and Scandal? Well, um, yes, uh, definitely with those shows. ABC, um, Scandal, um, How to Get Away with Murder, Grey's Anatomy, ABC has always been at the forefront of diversity. They walk their talk. Uh, every network has a, a diversity czar, but, you know, everybody at ABC, at ABC is, like, putting the muscle to the wheel. But television is also just about writing. It is about the writing. When the great scripts show up, they're going on the air, no matter who wrote them. Uh, it's about selling commercial time, and if you've got a, a brilliant idea for a show, it's going on the air. Dr. Lowe. Are there any shows or films that you can think of that does a great job of correctly portraying diversity in popular media? Um, when you say diversity, I mean, when I think about diversity in general, I think about diversity in access, right, diversity in age, diversity in sexuality, diversity in race. Um, honestly, I can't think of any show I mean, that... Well, I, what I find problematic is that, for example, I tend to want to watch African-American programming, um, but it's very difficult to find a TV show that really centers on a positive life with a black family. I mean, I just feel like there's often a tendency to, to put center whiteness within that picture somewhere, and so I find it uh, problematic. So I don't, I can't think of a TV show that I would just think that, oh, I know those people and I want to watch that show. I think that's why we tend to um, buy films that are um, either documentary or African-American films or African films and use those at home um, because I don't want to spend my time explaining a way that those characters are not realistic or um, especially to other family members, especially younger ones. Yeah. Professor Winter, do you think typecasting places limitations for actors of certain demographics? Absolutely. Um, there, was a, there was a time, I think it was in the, in the mid-90s, where the trend was to cast the villains as, uh, as albinos. And there were suddenly all these action movies where the villains were albinos. And there was a spike in uh, uh, targeting of albinos. Um, they were victims of crime. And there, uh, a group had to form and uh, go and address the, the the six big studios and say you can't keep portraying us this way we are becoming targeted and that trend stopped now you have the NAACP and all of these activities uh, organizations trying to lobby uh, Hollywood to to change this um, I don't really know what's happening with with Hollywood these days it's really hard and it's it's hard for women it's hard for everybody I don't necessarily think it's racism. Hollywood is definitely more sexist than it is racist, um, but neither of those are, are good things to be. How, how do we solve this? Um, I, I don't really know. Right now, so much is, is, is data-driven and driven by the bottom line. Um, if you look back 20 years ago, uh, we had the Rush Hour trilogy. We had Wesley Snipes' Blade trilogy. You know, these movies, um, these franchises made a half a billion dollars each, right? 
black protagonists, uh, the bodyguard with Whitney Houston, you know, huge money-making event. Um, and color did not really seem to be that much of an issue. Why is it now, 20 years later, it seems like we've gone into our time machines and we've moved backwards, you know? And I don't think we can blame that entirely on the creative people in Hollywood. Something else is going on in the subplot that we may not know. Isn't Hollywood just a reflection of our society? I recently spoke with a young actress who dealt with typecasting in her past and faced discrimination due to her Cuban heritage. Let's look at the clip for her story. I'm Cuban American and uh, actually you'd be surprised there's like a little racism within like the Latino community because of like your accent depending like where you're from. So um, I've actually had to train myself to get a neutral Spanish accent so that way they can't really know if like it's more of like a mix of like Mexican, Colombian and but definitely away from the Cuban, because like they, we don't speak proper Spanish. Like you definitely do experience it. They'll, they'll tell you straight up, oh, you're not Latin looking enough, or like we're only seeing Caucasians for this role, and like Caucasians for them can just be like blonde hair, blue eyes. So they are very like specific in what they want. It's definitely gonna get better, and a reason why I would, Jane the Virgin, CW definitely has been like a game changer for Latinas. Like that whole show, like represents like the whole Latino community and like just opens doors for us because now there's I mean it, we're in pilot season right now so I you know get to see the shows that they're going to be pitched to different networks and you see a lot more diverse looking projects coming up especially for Latin like Latinos. And this question is for both of you. Uh, Dr. Lowe, going forward what changes can the film and television industry make to show more realistic representation of humanity? Well I think we have to have uh, people behind the scenes uh, that are a, a more diverse representation of people behind the scenes, not just racially, but certainly that's uh, one of the most important areas because I think because Hollywood is representing or is reflecting that racism that is in our society, those images are just going to keep building and it's sort of like it's cyclical. Um, but if we don't have uh, people behind the scenes who are writers and creators and, and say, you know, we don't act like that, you know, so we don't, we're not directing actors to act more black, you know, and things that, that I mean, it's just ridiculous that actors are still in, um, encountering things like that. So I think that's the only way. And if, if it isn't really about the bottom line, well, black moviegoers are like 25%. Um, certainly, we contribute to that bottom line, and so we deserve accurate representations, as all um, communities do. And the same question to you, Professor Winter. What can Hollywood do? Um, you know, I don't hold out a huge amount of expectation for this to change. Mm -hmm. We all have our ideals. And for young artists, writers, directors, our ideals inspire us. Uh, you know, I look at all my students who are, you know, all the colors of the rainbow, and their ideals inspire them to be creative. Now, we also live in the realm of reality. And we cannot expect reality to give us the approbations for the things that come from our own mind and our own hearts. Those are ours. Guess what? If there were no Academy Awards, filmmakers would still be making films. That's it. So hopefully Hollywood will, you know, adjust itself in some way to be more accurate. But the solution is filmmakers need to keep making films, to make good films, to make films more often, and to find new ways using um, uh, digital media uh, or old-fashioned bus and truck and uh, hang a screen up on the wall and show your films. That's what Tyler Perry did. And ha Hollywood had to turn around and go to him. He created a new distribution format, a new distribution paradigm. And since then, he's made almost 20 films for Lionsgate. I think it's like between 15 and 20 films. That's a lot. Yeah. So forget about Hollywood. Let's go make movies. Right. Let's define our people. Let's define our, 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 our sex. Let's define who we are for ourselves. It's all we can do. We're artists. We're filmmakers. Life is short. Go make movies. Great. Thank you both for being here today. We really appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you so much. In the small town of Elmira, New York, a boy was born into an all-American family. The odds of him opening his own clothing store at the age of 18? One 
in 138,000. Excited to be a part of pop culture, he packed for the big city. The odds of finding someone to invest in his vision? One in 4.5 million. The odds of him achieving his dream in the fashion industry? One in 23 million. The odds of having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 68. I am Tommy Hilfiger, and my family is affected by autism. Learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Early diagnosis can make a lifetime of difference. So, same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. Wow, these are really good. You act surprised. Practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. It's a beautiful day out here. Sunny today with light breezes, giving way to clouds in the afternoon. We could see some light precipitation to moderate precipitation later on, followed by powerful storm-like conditions. 90 miles per hour winds are expected. Authorities are asking everyone, stay indoors. Thank you for watching On Point. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at CSUN On Point. Sunday mornings, you can watch us on LA's Channel 36 at 11.30, and you can listen at KCSN 88.5 FM at 5.30. That's also Sunday morning. For all of us here at On Point, I'm Rosanna Saracusa.